On a quiet farm in East Herefordshire, on Sunday the 22nd of March, 2009, a farmer was out on his farm. While driving his tractor, he came across a sports bag laying in the field. Obviously he thought this odd and wanted to check the bag before moving it off his property. He walked over to the bag and carefully opened the zip. Inside he spotted another blue plastic bag. It seemed to contain something that looked like a joint of meat. But it was wrapped up with tape. He had a bad feeling about the contents. More so when he prodded the bag with his finger and felt something soft. So he didn't open the inner bag. Instead he called the police. When the police arrived, they carefully looked in the bag and removed the plastic from the sports bag. To their horror, they found a human leg cut from the thigh. Suspicious indeed. The village roads were blocked and a search began, but nothing else was found and no clues discovered. Deputy Chief Inspector Michael Hanlon of the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit arrived at the scene and noted that the bag hadn't been disposed of very well as it was clearly easy to spot. Little did they realise on that day that the contents of that bag would lead police forces from several different counties on a manhunt. Back at the police headquarters, they were looking for an explanation as to whether the leg had been medically amputated or not. They ascertained that the leg hadn't been cauterised, so it wasn't a medical procedure, and a murder inquiry began. They called the investigation Operation Abnet. The first objective would be to find out who the victim was. But this proved difficult, as whoever he was, he wasn't showing up on the DNA database. This meant he hadn't any criminal dealings with the police before. Flyers were posted around the towns asking for the public's help, but it wasn't getting them far. The police were struggling, as they had nothing to go on. A week later, on March 29th, in Wheat, Hampstead, a town about 25 miles from the first discovery, a jogger came across another package. This contained a human arm. The police forensics went to work on trying to distinguish if the body parts were of one body or they were looking at multiple bodies. Possibly another murder. After DNA results came in, they knew it was the same person, but who was this poor person? They had little to go on. They didn't know where to look. There was no murder scene, no identification, the body parts showing up in different areas. They looked at missing persons, but the lack of ID made it near impossible. They didn't even know for definite if it was a male or female. On the 31st of March 2009, over a hundred miles away from the first discovery, another member of the public, a farmer while out digging in Ashford Beat, Leicestershire, found a human head. The Leicestershire police made a full-scale search of the area, 
but came up with nothing. The senior investigating officer had heard of the body parts being found in Hertfordshire and made contact with the Hertfordshire police. But they also had to carry on with their own inquiries just in case they were not connected. But through DNA, it was discovered the head was from the same body as the other parts. Both counties police worked together. They believed the head had been carried and placed in the hedgerow before animals dragged it into the field. Although they now had three body parts, the head and its features had been badly damaged by what they thought at the time was the animals. They still couldn't tell if it was male or female. The forensic anthropology team led by Sue Black at the University of Dundee for the Centre of Anatomy was called in to help as they had another missing person in the area, a young woman. They were anxious to know if it could be her. She told them no, they were looking at a middle-aged male. They looked into the head damage more and it was revealed that there were no animal bite marks so it couldn't have been them that caused it. On further investigation they found cut marks indicating the facial features had been removed purposely with a sharp instrument. The teeth were intact but matched no dental records. April the 7th and another body part, a leg, was found in Hertfordshire. April the 11th, the torso was found also in Hertfordshire. Now the police had something they could work with as the torso gave them some evidence of how this man was killed. The torso showed that he had been stabbed in the back. The police turned to the media for help in identifying the victim. They gave as much detail as they could. The body was Asian with a mixed heritage. They also released pictures of the bag that the parts were found in but obviously kept most of the details private. Meanwhile, the forensic team were working hard looking for clues into who was responsible for this horrific murder. They examined every inch of the material they were given, especially the tape that was used to wrap the body parts. The public police plea started to bring in results. Then one call came in that struck a chord. Someone called in explaining that they hadn't heard from a relative who seemed to match the police description. The person they mentioned had already been reported as missing by his friend on March the 15th. They finally got a possible name and address. Geoffrey Howe, a 49 year old kitchen salesman who lived in Southgate, London. The police went to visit the home of Mr Howe. Now at this time the police were still not sure who the victim was. When they called at the address they had been given by a concerned relative, they found two people living there. Stephen Marshall and his partner Sarah Bush. It was noted that they seemed nervous when asked why they were there and if they knew where Mr Howe was. 
They explained that they were renting the property from him, and as far as they knew, he was alive and well somewhere. But, when searching the property, the police found a personalised number plate of Mr Howe's, hidden in their wardrobe, and Howe's passport. Not happy with the differing responses, from Mr. Marshall and his partner when asked about Geoffrey Howe. The police would eventually take them into custody on April the 21st. It was discovered that Geoffrey Howe, a 49 year old salesman and former chef, and Stephen Marshall, a 38 year old personal trainer and former club bouncer, had known each other for some time and had worked together as partners at one time. Stephen Marshall had fallen on bad times, so Geoffrey Howe let them move in with him for a while. They were to pay rent to him, but they fell behind. This went on for some time. Eventually, tension built and how asked them to leave, but they wouldn't. It's claimed that Howe laughed at Marshall when he threatened to kill him if he tried to get them out of his house. The police still couldn't prove they had killed anyone or committed a crime. They could only hold them for so long unless they could find proof, and quickly. They searched the property throughout and forensic teams went through gathering information. It wasn't until they pulled the carpet back that large blood-stained areas were revealed. The forensics showed that the stabbing took place in the bedroom and the dismemberment carried out in the bathroom. Meanwhile, Back at police headquarters, a very calm and apparently charming marshal was giving no common answers to the officer's question. I'll confirm that is Geoffrey Howe. No comment. Do you recognise that person to be Geoffrey Howe? No comment. comment. And my understanding is he's been quite kind to you in the past by allowing you to stay at his home address. No comment. Are you surprised that he's... As he was adopted, his DNA couldn't be matched with his brother, who had reported him missing. Other avenues had to be taken. Forensic anthropologists were called to help. Could they match up the details from the skull with a photo they had obtained from Howe's family? They were successful and dental records were obtained. Now they had a name and Geoffrey Howe was formally identified. On the 21st of April, the couple, Marshall and Bush, were charged with the murder of Geoffrey Howe. At the trial, the forensics that was crucial to the case could prove that the fibres they found on the tape that was taken from the body parts wrapping was present in the home of Geoffrey Howe where Marshall and Bush were sleeping. The fibres came from the inflatable beds they had to buy after the murder because the bed was covered in blood and had to be disposed of. Other fibres were found that linked Marshall at the scene of the murder. The dismemberment, it was claimed at trial by the Dundee University experts, was done by someone who knew what they were doing as the body had been cut at the joints, making it easier and quicker than trying to cut through bone. This would lead the police to look further into Marshall's background. 
Did he have some kind of butcher knowledge? They couldn't find anything that would answer that question. But it would come out in court about how violent Marshall could be by threatening witnesses. It would become clearer towards the end of the trial with an astonishing revelation. From the beginning, Marshall and Bush blamed each other for the murder. They both pleaded not guilty. But at the last minute, Marshall admitted to dismembering the body, but not to the murder. The trial started on the 12th of January 2010 at St Albans Crown Court. The evidence was given and witnesses heard. It included the way they behaved after the murder, the disposal of the body parts, stealing Geoffrey Howe's money and selling his belongings, including the car that had the personalised number plate, which they had removed. As the trial went on, Marshall, on the 29th of January, made another turn in his case. He admitted to the murder. He admitted to stabbing Howe in the back while he was sleeping on March the 8th, 2009. This, in turn, lessened the case for Bush. Her charges of murder was now dropped and she admitted to helping dispose of the body and theft. Then came another revelation by Marshall's own defence barrister, telling the courts of his involvement with London gangs and how he had disposed of executed bodies for them, on at least four occasions in the 90s. And that's where he learned how to dismember bodies, and that's how he knew what to do. The court was in shock at this confession. Now came the sentencing. On the 1st of February, 2010, Marshall got life and will not be eligible for parole for 36 years. As for his confession about his connection with disposing of bodies for gangs, the police couldn't find any links and Marshall refused to give any more details. But it was revealed that Marshall had previous convictions for criminal damage, assault, cocaine possession and possessing a firearm. Bush, after changing her plea to guilty, was sentenced to three years and nine months for perverting the course of justice. Geoffrey Howe's case became known as the Jigsaw case. Thank you for watching.